Yep. Ages ago. And this school had just been, you know, started. Yep. So, <clears throat> nanomaterials for bad. Thank you very much for having me here. And actually, I tend to like to ask you guys questions when I lecture, and I'd love to be interrupted. So please don't, don't save your questions for the end. As we go through, if there's something that you don't understand or are curious about, or you want me to put it in a bigger context, please raise your hand. So I, I am going to focus on nanomaterials for batteries. I know Chanye just gave you a really excellent introduction on the fundamentals of batteries. So I'm not going to really focus on the basic materials. I'm going to focus on what happens when you make them really small. Now, you all obviously care about batteries because you're all carrying them in your cell phone or your laptop. But in particular, I'm going to focus on lithium ion batteries today. And the reason for that is because of the very high energy density for low mass. And it's hopefully what I'll convince you of at the end is also the small volume is important. And in particular, when we think about the common applications that affect our everyday life, I'm sure all of you would tell me that you wish your laptop, your cell phone, or your tablet lasted longer. And particularly with smartphones now, if you've used your GPS while talking on the phone, or you have, say, young children like I do, and you let them watch videos on your phone, the battery gets drained much too quickly. So we need to find a way to make batteries last longer. The applications, as you get larger, get more complicated. So I'm going to focus on this one in a minute. It's a really beautiful car, the Tesla Roadster. But we can also think about large-scale energy storage for applications like wind farms or photovoltaics where the energy isn't produced 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so we need a good way to store them. In those cases, what we need are batteries that will charge and discharge very quickly. So it's not just how much energy they store and how long they last, it's how quickly can you get them in and out. And that is one of the major reasons why people are working on nanostructured materials. Okay, so the Tesla Roadster. I could have shown you a laptop, but it's not nearly as cool. This car is an all-electric vehicle. And I like to show it to general public, so non-scientific public, because they typically have a misconception that electric cars can't be fast. And that's not true. This car is faster than a Lamborghini at short distances. Not at long distances, certainly, but for short, 0 to 60 to 3.9 seconds is not bad. The key is that it drives about 244 miles on a single charge. But I put that in quotes because it's a lot like your cell phone. That's the driving distance when you buy the car new. As you use the battery, that distance shortens. And in a very ironic twist, the more aggressive a driver you are, and keep in mind this is a sports car, the shorter that distance is. So if you like to accelerate quickly, you are going to shorten the cycle life of the battery, and you won't get as much energy out. Now the real kicker for me is it's the manufacturing is very similar to laptop batteries. They just put about 7,000 in the trunk of the car. And the really important part is this price. So what people are working on are ways to build this battery cheaper, faster, and with better heat management. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on today are really just a few case studies. For the first part of the talk, about the first half, I'm going to talk about three materials. All of these are cases where in the bulk, the material itself is not a good battery material. But when you make it nanostructured, you improve or you eliminate um, one of the key features. So for example, we're going to talk about tin oxide just very briefly. Its problem is that when it lithiates, you form lithium oxide in tin. Then you lithiate a second step and you make a lithium tin alloy that has a very high capacity for lithium. But the volume expansion is so big that the material pulverizes and it can't be used. That's very similar for silicon, which is currently a very popular anode material. So I'll show you examples of that. And then we're going to come back to lithium iron phosphate, which you've just heard about. And the problem in that case is that the material has such low electrical conductivity that in the bulk, you can't make good contact to it. So you can't cycle it, you can't get charge out. At the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about approaches to fabricate three-dimensional architectures for batteries, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And the purpose of that is really to um, get the best of nanostructured materials in a new way to try to make better batteries. So you just learned about intercalation chemistry, and you learned about how lithium ions go in and out of cathode materials. But now I have a question for you. Say we focus on the cathode material, so say it's lithium cobalt oxide, for example, and we are discharging this battery, so lithium ions are going to migrate from the graphite on the anode side through the electrolyte into the cathode. What do you think happens to that electrode as the lithium ions are going in? Shrink. 
it will actuate? It will actually, actually, I've actually never used heard that word used. That is an excellent word yeah. for that. Yeah. As, the, as uh, the charge be doped from the cathode, there will be changes in sub volume because of the de doping. That's exactly right. And now you hit on two things that I want to emphasize. One, um, you, there are changes in bond lengths. So as you're changing from iron two plus to iron three plus, say for lithium iron phosphate or for cobalt, cobalt four plus to cobalt three plus, there are changes in bond lengths. You're also adding lithium ions, which take up a certain volume, so the entire electrode has to expand. Then when you discharge, sorry, that's in the discharge case. When you charge this battery, and now you're forcing lithium over to the graphite side, that means this electrode is going to shrink, this electrode is going to expand, and again, you get this expansion and contraction. So if you've ever noticed that your cell phone battery stops keeping good charge, what has most likely happened is that your electrodes have pulverized themselves and they're not in good electrical contact to the metal foil current collector anymore. It's not necessarily that there's been a chemical degradation. Now what we're talking about is mechanical stress. Now there's another problem. When the lithium gets to the surface of this electrode, what has to happen if I want to put, say, another mole of lithium in? So I put a mole of lithium on the surface. Now what has to happen if I want to put more lithium in that structure? The ones that are already on the surface have to move inside the electrode. That's exactly right. The lithium that's on the surface has to diffuse in. This is solid state diffusion, which at room temperature is very slow. So if we take this electrode now, I'm focusing on the cathode, but it's true for both cases, and I make it really small, nanoparticles or nanowires or sheets. I eliminate the solid state diffusion problem essentially because now basically the whole structure is mostly surface and so there isn't that much solid state diffusion that has to happen. And also as the material expands and contracts, really small particles can dissipate that mechanical stress more effectively. So that's what we really want to focus. This first half of the talk, we're just talking about diffusion of lithium into and out of electrodes. So there's a great cartoon of this. I'm going to show you the, uh, this is from a Nature Nanotechnology paper and the reference will be on the next slide. And this is just a schematic of what happens. So say I take um, a material like silicon as a film. After I cycle it the first time, it's basically pulverized because the mechanical stress really can only be dissipated by fracturing the material. If I make large spherical particles, the same thing happens. Now in this case, the challenge is that you're making smaller particles that now are not directly contacted to the current collector. So whereas each of these particles were contacted to the current collector here, these small particles have to go through several grain boundaries. The electrons have to go through several grain boundaries to get to the current collector. So that's not necessarily a good thing. One way to solve this is to take these small particles and suspend them in a conductive binder. And this is typically what the battery industry does. So you make powders of your electric material, you add some conductive additives, some nice organic solvents to make a paste, and that, in that way these little particles are in good electrical contact to the binder itself, which is in good contact to the current collector. And then the other approach is to make nanowires. So in this case, if I have a nanowire and I charge it, I still get nanowires at the end, they're just a little bit thicker. And what's happened is you get very good electron transport in one dimension, and you get very good mechanical relaxation in the radius of the nanowire. So this is the advantage of, of making nanowires. The first real example of this was tin oxide. So, and my reference got cut off on the bottom, I apologize. This is from Chuck Martin, who used to be at Colorado State and now is in Florida. And what he did is he made arrays of tin oxide nanowires using sol gel chemistry. Tin was thought to be um, a potentially exciting electrode material because it has a very high volumetric capacity for lithium, much higher than graphite. But it has such a large volume expansion that once you cycle it, it pulverizes. So if we look here at capacity in milliamp hours per gram versus discharge rate, and you just learned about C rates. This is the thin film, and you can see that as we try to charge it faster and faster, it's pulverizing so quickly, and the lithium diffusion is so slow that it can't keep up, so the capacity drops very quickly. If we look at this narrow structured electrode though, it maintains good capacity up to very high discharge rates. So that really was the first example of, of a real, the real advantage of nanostructuring materials. Now if we look at capacity in milliamp hours per gram again versus cycle number, you see a similar thing happen. Thin film, the capacity degrades as a function of cycle number, 
For the nanostructured electrode, it actually improves slightly. And this is because as it's charging, the electrode's expanding, and then you discharge and it contracts, and you're, surf you're roughening the surface. So you're getting even more surface area, so you see the capacity go up for a single charge rate. If this had been cycled much further, you, you would see it start coming down, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Yes? Uh, I have a basic question. When you say that SNO2 uh, is better than graphite from the charge capacity yes. point of view, can you elaborate what does it mean, charge capacity? How do we calculate it or measure it? That is calculated in terms of milliamp hours per gram. And so graphite is at about 300. I'll show you the number in several slides. And tin is about 2200. So much higher. So what, what is this value? I, I this think. value is, if you compare it, say you're thinking about a real application. So say you're thinking about your car. If you had a cathode that could match this, so we'll ignore that for a minute. If we're comparing, um, say, a tin anode to a graphite anode, it would be the difference between being able to drive, say, 300 miles and being able to drive 800 miles. So it's, so it's actually the number of lithium ions that you can store per unit mass or per unit volume. And each of those lithium ions is associated with one electron. So what you're really counting is how much current can I get out for my battery pack. So it does, it's only contains the intercalated ion, not those right. ions which are stored in the uh, bilayer. That's exactly right. That's an excellent point. It's only the capacity of your electrode material is limited by how much lithium can you put into the structure itself. And then practically what it's limited by is how much can you put it, put in and get out reversibly. So in some materials, which you just heard of, if you take all the lithium out, the structure collapses and it's not reversible anymore. So what practically you care about is how much can you put in and get out reversibly. Thank you. Yeah, so great questions. Okay, so now we're going to switch to silicon. And the reason I wanted to focus on this one is because it is currently a very popular material. It's earth abundant, non-toxic, obviously, and it has a very high capacity. So. The way people study these materials is now we're measuring the potential versus lithium, lithium plus. So the way these experiments are done is typically the material you care about, in this case silicon, is your working electrode in a liquid cell and you're cycling it versus a lithium metal reference electrode and a lithium metal counter electrode. So your counter electrode is providing a large number of lithium ions and you're, you're measuring potential and then you're calculating the capacity that you need. So for silicon nanowires, with this very high surface area, what's so exciting about this is that in the first cycle, if you cycle very slowly, this is a C divided by 20, you get, this is the first cycle, you see the potential drop here as you're charging it. You see that it hits almost its theoretical capacity of about 4,800 milliamp hours per gram. Discharge, and then you see the second cycle, cycle here, so you've lost a little bit of the capacity, and then you go back but it is reversible. And I apologize, all my references are getting cut off at the end, so I don't know if it's possible to load the slides somewhere um, later so that you guys can have it, or I'm happy to email them to you as well. But there are references on all these slides that we're not seeing. So in this material, what you're actually making is lithium 4.4 silicon. The volume increases by about 300%. So obviously in the bulk, this would never work, but when you have a nanowire, it does actually work. And you get very close to the theoretical max. The measured capacity is about 4,200. Then if we look at charge rate, so how quickly can I get lithium in and out? We start at the C divided by 20, and again, we're measuring potential versus lithium as a function of capacity. And what you're looking at here are the charge curves on the bottom, the discharge curves on the top. And what you're seeing is that at slow rates, you get really good capacity. As you make the material cycle faster and faster, by the time you get to a C rate here, the capacity is dropped, but not nearly by as much as you would expect for the bulk material. So making silicon as nanowires really does improve not only the, the total capacity of lithium that you can get in and out, but how fast you can do it. Now this is where it compares to graphite. So this is exactly what we were just talking about. The dotted line on the bottom is the theoretical capacity for graphite. And then all of the data I'm showing you on top is the silicon. 
So first, if we focus on the squares, this is the capacity that you measure for each cycle when you're charging the silicon. The circles are when you're discharging, and you see, first of all, that they don't match. Now that happens at the very beginning when you cycle a battery, because there are some effects of the liquid electrolyte decomposing that's not reversible. And then there's some surface formation of this decomposition. This is called the solid electrolyte interface layer that forms. So the way this works in industry is they will take a brand new battery, they cycle it until these two data points overlap. That's called the forming process. And then they sell you the battery. So when, by the time you get a battery, it's already been cycled very carefully a certain number of times to make sure these values match. But here we're starting at the very first cycle. You see there's a big difference here that's mostly SEI formation and surface roughening. You see that the values are getting closer and closer, but note that we're well above the 3,000 million hours per gram. And then if you take um, the silicon, just nanocrystals now, so not nanowires, and you do the same thing, you see the capacity is dropping pretty quickly here. It's still a lot better than graphite, but it's not nearly as good as the nanowires. Now, why do you think that is? So we're comparing silicon nanoparticles to silicon nanowires. Why do you think the nanoparticles don't have the same capacity as the nanowires? They probably broke, they, they probably broke at some point? That's right. They're not, in, they're not in direct contact with the current collector. So the nanoparticles at the top are only in electrical contact through basically uh, tunneling through contact barriers for all the other nanoparticles. So as you cycle and you imagine these little nanoparticles are expanding and contracting, those contact resistances get higher, and so you just you can't get as much looking in and out. So this is one example, a uh, very nice example, of comparing just morphology. There's still nanostructured materials, but the spherical nanoparticles don't perform nearly as well as the nanowires because then each nanowire has direct contact to the current collector. So this is silicon. That was silicon. Are there any questions at all before we move on to the cathode material? Yes? Now, how do you capture the same activity? Is it connected to the theoretical capacity or the capacity? Calculating the C rate, if it's, it should be, there are different uh, philosophies on how to do this. And I should tell you that in my field, this is not always done very well because what it basically comes about down to is you knowing the active mass of the material that you are cycling. So you have to know how many grams of material am I cycling, and then you measure the current as a function of the voltage profile you're looking at, and then you say, well, I know this is the total mass that I had, this is the current that I've passed, and then from that you calculate the C rate. So if you make, say, nanowires on a centimeter squared substrate, how easily do you think you can measure the mass of that material? This is a trick question. I'm giving you a, a I'm trying to not strongly word my opinion on some of the papers in this field. But my point is if you have much less than a milligram of material, you probably cannot weigh it effectively. And so in those cases, it's based off the theoretical capacity. It's not based off the actual mass. But if you're careful when you, when you do these experiments, you should measure the mass very carefully, and then you measure the total current passed while you're both watching the voltage profile. Let's see. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so okay, so now let's move on to an example of a cathode material. The two anode materials I just showed you, the advantage of nanostructuring is that you make high surface area so the volume expansions aren't as dramatic, and you can make good electrical contact. Now we'll move to a cathode material that I think is an interesting example, which is lithium iron phosphate. As you've just heard in the previous lecture, the problem with this material is that it has a very low electrical conductivity. So what John Goodenough, and, who originally developed this material, figured out was that you had to have very good binders. There had to be good, high electrical conductivity binders. Then the next step in the evolution of this material was Yetman Chang at MIT who figured out that if you made really small particles and suspended them in good binders, it, you could get around the low electrical conductivity of the particle because the binder could carry the current. And what you really wanted is to get the lithium ions in and out. So then, now I'm going through history fairly quickly, 
That spun off a company called A123, which is the largest lithium ion battery manufacturer in the United States. And their claim to fame was making batteries that had very high power. So you could make this cathode material that would discharge very quickly, and they used it initially in applications like power drills. The reason this material is exciting uh, is for a couple of reasons. One, it's really safe. So lithium cobalt oxide, for example, cobalt's toxic, but the real problem is that when you have a lithium battery with a material like that in it, and there is some fire, say there's a short between your cathode and your anode, lithium cobalt oxide at elevated temperatures decomposes to evolve oxygen. So you have a fire with its own oxygen source. Lithium iron phosphate is much more stable at high temperatures, and it doesn't decompose in the same way. So the advantage is all non-toxic earth abundant elements, it's safer, but the problem in the bulk is that it's an insulator. So we already know that if you make nanoparticles, you can make very good batteries, and A123 has done that. The next step is the one that I'm going to show you now that, I'm, that I think is just very clever, and I can't figure out if they actually did this on purpose or if it was an accident, and you'll see why in a moment. So if you look at a ternary phase diagram of phosphorus oxide, lithium oxide, and iron oxide, what this is showing you, how many of you have seen phase diagrams before? Are familiar with them? Okay, a lot of you. This is a way that solid state chemists try to map out um, composition space. So if I look at any one side, so for example, this side, this is basically a binary phase diagram. I have iron oxide, phosphorus oxide, and it shows me what all the stable iron phosphorus oxides are. If I look on the phosphorus oxide, lithium oxide line, I get all these lithium phosphorus oxides. These are important. This gray semicircle is showing you the phase space for these lithium phosphorus oxides that form typically as glassy materials. And the reason they're exciting is because they are excellent lithium ion conductors. They conduct lithium so fast that at room temperature they start to approach lithium diffusion rates. So very fast lithium ion conductors here. These are amorphous materials typically. If I look in the middle right here, this is lithium iron phosphate, the electrode material that we care about, the cathode material. So the trick here in the experiment that I'm going to show you is they took lithium iron phosphate, but they made compositions that were moving along this line that I'm showing in red, going to A, which are lithium and phosphorus rich. So this was the challenge. Again, I wish the um, references hadn't been cut off, but but these, this is a paper from Cannon and Cedar, and what they really were looking at was the structure of lithium iron phosphate. And what they figured out is that the lithium ion diffusion is direction dependent. So if I look down the 0, 0, 1 axis, and here I'm showing you oxygen in red, lithium is blue, the phosphorus is in gray, you see the tiny ones here, and the iron is in yellow. Hopefully what you see from this image is that there's no open space. So you can imagine it would be very difficult for lithium ion to diffuse down that direction. If I look down the 100, again, it looks like a very dense structure. There aren't very many open spaces. But if I look down the 010, there are these open channels here. And you can imagine that lithium ions will go in and out quickly. So what they wanted to do was make small particles so that the electrical conductivity could be taken care of by the binder all around it. But they wanted to put this surface coating that would let lithium ions diffuse very quickly so that the lithium ions can hit the particle, diffuse through the coating really fast until it finds this direction. And once it finds that direction, it can go into this particle quickly. So the way they did this, <coughs> this is the abstract from that paper. And this is the part, um, again, that I, is either incredibly brilliant or was very lucky. Their strategy was to start with an off-stoichiometry of the starting materials to heat it to high temperature to form lithium iron phosphate and then cool it carefully in such a way that the lithium phosphorus oxide phases form a coating that will phase separate from the lithium iron phosphate. So you put everything in at the beginning at once, you heat it, then as you slowly cool it, the lithium iron phosphate is going to make the core of the particle, the lithium phosphate, the lithium phosphorus oxide is going to make this coating that's going to get lithium ions to fuse around the surface very quickly and then you're going to let the lithium ions find these open channels. The TEM of the particle is very difficult to conclusively see this coating. You see um, a nice 
high resolution image here, you can see the columns of atoms for lithium iron phosphate. There is this fuzzy, about five nanometer area here they're calling the coating. They did a lot of really nice spectroscopy to show that it is lithium phosphorus oxide on the surface. That data is more convincing. But this is so you see what the particles are and you see some sense of scale. This is how it actually performs. Now keep in mind that these experiments are done with the lithium iron phosphate as the cathode in a liquid electrolyte with tons of lithium, excess lithium as the common reference. So this is sort of the ideal case. But if we plot now voltage versus lithium as a function of capacity, even at 2C, which is the slowest rate they tried, and that's really fast. Your cell phones are rated to work between C divided by 2 and C divided by 5. So this is a 2C rate. They see that the, the capacity of their electrode is very close to the theoretical capacity. As they go to faster C rates, even to 50C, you still see a very reasonable capacity, which is incredible. You do see capacity <coughs> loss here. I'm plotting capacity in milliamp hours per gram as a function of cycle number. You see 20C um, has good capacity. 60C doesn't have as good capacity, but it's still pretty incredible. And what's really important is that out to about even 50 cycles, they haven't shown a capacity loss. These are, to my knowledge, the fastest charging rates that have been demonstrated for lithium ion batteries. Certainly, they are approaching the rate of a supercapacitor, and it seems to show good charge stability, or uh, capacity stability. So, for this first section, hopefully what I showed you then is, we can take electrode materials that in the bulk are not very good for some fatal flaw, either volume expansion, low electrical conductivity. If we make them nanostructured, there are no quantum mechanical effects that happen. It's not, it's not the same as making quantum dots, say, for solar cells. But there are good mechanical stress release mechanisms that occur. You can get around low electrical conductivity. And in this case, what you can do is really optimize which direction lithium ions go into the particles to make it fast. So let's go back to this picture. So what we just talked about was diffusion of lithium into the electrodes. Now what I want to talk about is this distance. So the experiments I just showed you, all of those papers did what we call half-cell experiments. So they took the, the electrode material they cared about, put it in a liquid electrolyte, so you have fast lithium ion diffusion in the liquid, lithium metal as the counter reference electrode so that you have a huge excess of lithium metal. But that's not how your batteries really work. Your real batteries have a real anode, a real cathode, there's a mechanical separator in between with some liquid electrolyte, and now you have all the complications of both electrodes having to interact with each other. So if you wanted to make a real battery that charged and discharged very quickly, we know that we can make this side high surface area, we know that we can make this side high surface area, but the key now is to try to get them as close to each other as possible. So, these are what normal batteries look like. These are what the batteries that you guys have all seen or are carrying, whether it's a cylindrical um, 18650 or the kind of cell that you would see in your laptop or cell phone. This, they're all the same in that they are films that get stacked or rolled. So each of these films has some current collector, say aluminum on the cathode side. This film is going to be typically powders of your cathode suspended in binders and then applied as a slurry. Then you have some electrolyte that'll separate that side, an anode, and then current collector on the other side. This is what, in my field, we call a two-dimensional battery. So basically, you are always going to be limited by how fast lithium ions can get from the anode to the cathode because they're still separated by some significant distance. What we want to build are 3D batteries. I'm showing you two of what I think are the best examples in the literature. Now, 3D batteries, the concept is, if, if I imagine my fingers as my nanowires or nanoparticles, instead of having them physically separated, I want to fit them together like the bristles of a brush. And I need to do that in such a way that they don't ever touch and they don't short. So, to date, there is no true 3D battery that actually holds charge. They, all examples that have been reported so far um, short in some way, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. The first um, example of an approach to this using wet chemical methods came from Andreas Stein at the University of Minnesota. And what he did is he made uh, basically a reverse opal structure. So he took silicon spheres, he let them slowly fall out of solution and pack into a three-dimensional structure, 
coated the surface with carbon, and then chemically dissolved away the silica sphere. So what you end up left with then is the carbon making a reverse image of what your spheres were. Then you coat that with a chemical polymerization process. You have a polymer electrolyte now that's going to separate everything. And you fill in the empty holes. In his case, he used vanadium oxide nanoparticles. So if you look at a cross-sectional image of this, you see the framework, which is the carbon. It's coated with the polymer electrolyte. And then these balls are vanadium oxide nanoparticles. The challenge in this case was that the vanadium oxide wasn't conductive enough, so it was very difficult to make electrical contact with the particles. And chemical polymerizations almost always leave behind um, pinhole defects. And anywhere you get a pinhole defect, the material, your cathode and anode will touch and you'll get the short. In terms of the potential for the very highest power density, that comes from Deborah Rolison's lab at the Naval Research. So she starts with uh, carbon aerogel, which is an incredibly high surface area material. Again, either chemically or electrochemically coats with a polymer and then fills in, in her case, with the cathode, which is ruthenium oxide. Now in this field, power density, so how fast you can charge and discharge your battery, has to do with how high a surface area are your two electrodes and more importantly, how close they are. So power, de power density scales with surface area. That's what you should get out of this particle. So this is an area that my group works in, and I want to show you our approach. I'm certainly not saying that it is the best approach, but this is the approach that we decided to take to try to build this kind of battery. We decided that we didn't want to think about the specific chemicals to start. We wanted to think about how would you have to make each piece to ensure that you had good electrical contact and that there was no possibility for shorting. So what we decided to do was use electroplating which is um, an easy way to make materials. It allows you to scale up the amount of material that you make, and you can control very carefully the quality of your product, and you can use the electrochemical plating to measure how well your materials are going down. So the way that we build our battery is we start with copper foam. It's about 98% air, and it has a surface area that's about 100 times higher than um, the equivalent footprint of a copper foil. So it's a lot less copper than what's typically used in your batteries. We use that as our electrode. We put it in a water-based bath and we electroplate our anode. We use copper and tin in our case. This is actually purple, so we see the copper foam turn purple. Then what's useful about copper and timonite is that it's a really good metal, so we can use it as an electrode. We then put it in another aqueous bath. We do an electrochemical polymerization to conformally coat with our polymer electrolyte. And then we make a, 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 what looks like a black ink of cathode particles in conductive binders that are designed to wet really well to the polymer, but they don't dissolve it. So what happens is when we put our ink on top, it permeates through the whole foam, and we put a current collector on top. Now the reason we wanted to do this is because if you calculate power density, these are just calculated, so we haven't proven any of this yet. If you get a structure that has a thousand times higher surface area, you would get a thousand times higher improvement power density. Because we electroplate our anode, we get about two-thirds of the size of the battery for the same energy as um, a typical lithium-ion battery. Because it's all solid state, we don't have any liquid electrolyte, we get very long cycle life. And actually, we've gone out to about 1,000 cycles at 2C rates, and, and we do see very good cycle life. And again, we've got rid of the liquid, so it's quite a bit safer. Um, the copper and terminite is safer than graphite, and we don't use any of the common LIPF6 salt that's typically used in batteries. That's a problem because if it sees any water, it generates HF acid, and that etches bone. So um, in many states now, there are laws that if you get, at least in the United States, there are laws that if you get in a car accident in an electric vehicle, um, they are not supposed to try to get you out. They're supposed to call a hazardous waste team first. So we would like to get rid of that to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, the, the advantage of using electroplating, and there are other, a lot of other people in this field, like Deborah Rawls, who use this approach, is that it really is very well known in industries like the semiconductor industry, and it's cheap. So typical lithium ion batteries are manufactured anywhere from 500 to 1,000 dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, our calculated cost is about 348. So it would be a good way to make cheap batteries if we can make it work. So I want to go back to just put it in the perspective of other battery chemistries that you've seen today. Typically, battery people talk about mass. So this is power density, watts per kilogram, versus energy density in watt hours per kilogram. 
And I'm showing you some of the battery chemistries you've already seen today. So lead acid is down here. This is the nickel metal hydride battery in the Prius. You see the A123 lithium ion battery. There is a, a very exciting new company, Envia, that just came out with a very high energy density cell. So their new cell is out here. And then our cell is up here in terms of power density. So a little bit better than an ultra capacity. Now, if, if what you care about, though, is volume, then we are much higher. And that's because copper and timonite, our anode material, is really heavy. And so you see that we, we do better in terms of volume than we do in terms of mass. But the point here is that I could put either of the other two 3D batteries that I showed you up here with us. And the point of this is that nanostructured materials can do a lot on their own. But if you don't assemble them in a way where they're in really close contact, you don't really get the benefit in terms of the power density that you could. So I think a lot of the, the field is trying to move now to 3D batteries. Let me, in the last three minutes, show you how our anode material by itself behaves. So we picked copper and timonite because although the gravimetric capacity here is lower than graphite, now here the th theoretical capacity for graphite is about 372. Most cells run at about 300. The volumetric capacity is much larger. Now the reason I, I really picked this material is because the volume expansion is not nearly as large as it is for silicon or tin. The volume expansion for copper and timonite is about 75% as opposed to the 300% I told you that the silicon suffers from. And the reason for that is the structure. You see I've circled the antimony atoms, five of them in red, um, the copper here is in blue. It cycles through two plateaus. You make one intermediate and you end up at Li3Sb. The antimony atoms don't change structure. They make a, a framework basically that breathes in and out. The copper comes out, lithium goes in, and this process is reversible. But the other reason we chose this material is because it lithiates about 50 millivolts more positive than lithium metal. So chemically, you can't plate lithium metal on the surface. So you don't get the dendritic growth of lithium that is a problem in lithium ion batteries. And that eliminates one of the possibilities of shorts. This is what the foam looks like when it's been electroplated. This is about um, a two minute deposition. You see a very high surface area, a lot of room for cathode material to fit in. If you zoom in, you see that the copper and timonite plates a lot faster at edges of high curvature, which is very common for electroplating. And then if you really zoom in, you see cubic faceting, and that's very typical for the copper and timonite. So we can conformally coat these high surface area structures very quickly if we want to know how it cycles just by itself. We package it as pouch cells, which look like your cell phone battery. In this experiment, what we did is we used a commercial separator, we used commercial liquid electrolyte and a commercial cathode. We started at 1.8C and finished at 2C. And you see this is the little forming process I told you about. You see that the capacity increases a bit because we're roughening the copper and timonite as we cycle it. And then if we measure the potential profile, so potential versus lithium as a function of time, every 20 cycles we see it staying the exact same, so it's not decomposing. Now your, your phones or your laptops are designed to tell you that the battery is dead when you drop to about 80% capacity. So if we go all the way out and see where we hit 80, we hit that at about 725, and what we figured out now is the reason we lose capacity here is actually from the commercial electrolyte. If we take that out, fresh electrolyte back in, the capacity of our anode goes back up, and we can keep cycling it. If we compare that behavior to, uh, to a real battery, so this red data is actually a battery that we took out of a BlackBerry, stripped the controls off, and we cycled it also at 2C. What you see is that commercial batteries are just not meant to cycle that fast. So the capacity retention drops really quickly, whereas this high surface area anode that is packaged also as an equivalent battery. So it's not a half cell experiment. It has real cathode material and a real separator. We can maintain really good capacity. This is what our battery looks like today. So instead of the thin films that get stacked like your commercial battery, what we have is just a single piece. What you're seeing here is a scanning electron microscope image of one of our batteries. This is the aluminum mesh that we use as the current collector for the cathode side. If we freeze it in liquid nitrogen and crack it, what you see is that the copper foam is actually hollow, and that's a function of how it's made. You see the copper and timonite, remember it's thicker where there's high curvature. You see the polymer electrolyte surrounding the copper and timonite, and then you see the cathode slurry that wets really well. 
So where we are today, our battery does hold charge, it is actually a real battery. Because we electrochemically polymerize our polymer, there are no thermal defects and we can test for that. The problem is that our polymers right now are too slow in terms of lithium ion conductivity. So our battery cycles a lot better if we put it in a 100 C oven. It doesn't cycle very well at room temperature, which is not useful for cars, for sure. So what we're working on are chemical methods to make our the lithium ion conductivity in the polymer much faster. So we know that the, the solid state diffusion in the ionodes really fast. We know we have good electrical conductivity in the cathode. Um, now we just have to fix the polymer. So hopefully, if you just remember anything from the talk today, hopefully what you remember is that nanostructured electric materials can be used to alleviate problems typically found in bulk materials, like um, volume expansion and low conductivity. But 3D architectures really are a good way to, to combine the benefits of nan nanostructured materials with really short diffusion lengths to get overall very high power density batteries so that you could eliminate having to use a battery and a supercapacitor for applications like cars. So with that, I'm happy to answer any other questions before we head off to lunch. Questions? Did your batteries recharge? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Um, has anybody ever thought to use uh, like um, organic conducting polymers for this type of device? Like, I, I just learned that, um, I went to a conference before I came here, that in the biosensing world, they use organic or chemical cells, yeah. uh, materials like P.PSS. Yes. And then the transistor can be de doped when it's gated, so the ion is doped the same way. That's right. Uh, can that material be used in these type of applications? Or? There are people trying to use it in two ways. There are people trying to make flexible, flexible, flexible excuse me, batteries that are all organic. Okay. The only challenge is that those materials typically don't have a big voltage range that you would like for a battery, so you don't get high power out. But they are. You know, the argument is very similar to making all organic PVs. So you would, in theory, these would be cheaper, certainly flexible, um, and probably easier to make. There is a lot of chemistry in the slurry side. So you take these cathode and anode materials that both of us have talked about. When you make it in the slurry, you do add conductive organic polymers. And that is a good way to make the, the electrical conductivity high. It makes a, a paste that has great mechanical and adhesive properties and that you can dry and control the way. So there, that's where most of the organic chemistry is, is in terms of the slurry chemistry. The mechanical separators that are typically found in batteries are organic based, and they tend to be um, molded and then stretch formed to make porous materials. So they're also organic based. Um, they're not electrically conductive, but they are ionic. Yes? Why CU2SP. Antimony is the only active material in CU2SP. That's right. So if you can just take electrolytic forces antimony, you can increase the energy. Yes. You can, but the volume expansion is so much bigger uh -huh. that we don't get as good of a rate capability. The other thing that we've discovered, there are a couple of reasons we chose it. I'll tell you why we chose it in the beginning, and then I'll tell you what actually happened. That was a surprise. So we chose it because of the small volume um, expansion. We chose it because it's an excellent metal. The electrical conductivity is very high, much higher than elemental antimony. And the reason we thought that was important is because electrical conductivity typically scales with thermal conductivity as well. And we wanted an electrode that could dissipate heat well. So our concern was that if this battery actually works and it discharges as quickly as it should, it will get pretty hot. The other advantage is that when the copper gets extruded, it makes a conductive framework that keeps all of the antimony and electrical contact. And we've done a lot of experiments where we've electrodeposited onto transmission electron microscopy grids, and we've cycled it and imaged it, and we see that the copper really is important for getting good electrical conductivity. Now, what we found out that we did not anticipate is that if you have antimony metal touching copper metal at room temperature, it's 
Enthalpy of formation is so favorable that it will diffuse at room temperature and form copper into metal. So, even if we lose a little bit of the copper that gets extruded into our polymer electrolyte, the antimony scavenges copper from the foam and reforms itself. So what we've seen is that if we cycle really fast, like 15C, and our capacity drops, most battery materials can't recover from that, even if you cycle slowly after that. What we see is that we see a big drop in capacity, then when we go back to 1C or 2C, the capacity completely recovers, and it's because of this copper and antimony reforming. So that I would not have predicted, but it turns out to be important for the second life. I would like to know, uh, since you're using a kind of uh, foam, mm -hmm. and when you want to electric deposit something on the foam, uh, unless we have uh, a very good counter electrode, yes. which completely yes. uh, interface inside it, we cannot have a completely uniform layer. So how do you solve this problem? This is my first question, and the second question is that how do you solve the problem of electrical conductivity of that cathode slurry? Oh my gosh, those are great questions. They, okay. The way we, the electroplating is absolutely critical, and what helps us is this diffusion of copper and antimony, because it doesn't actually have to be perfect in the center, but it has to sit for at least a minute at room temperature and it will heal itself. The way that we do that deposition is out of water. We use, um, my ultimate goal is to make this battery all out of water with nothing toxic except the antimony. The antimony you certainly wouldn't want to eat a lot of it. But the rest is all aqueous based, all done in commercially available electric cleaning tanks. So we use citric acid because it's a special molecule that as you raise the pH of the solution, it binds to the two metals and it keeps them in close contact it shifts their reduction potentials right on top of each other, so you don't get the diffusion problems that you would typically get with normal weather fading. Then the second part of it is we use a pulse plating procedure. So we pulse, then we go back to a rest potential, and we let the solution recover, and we pulse again, exactly because of what you're saying. And then the last part of it is that we have spent a lot of time trying to find good counter electrodes. And what we use now are very high surface area stainless steel sponge, that is, um, and we use two on either side, so we use a bipolar configuration, so that it's at least the same at the surface on both sides. That took a long time to figure out, so that, I hope that answers your question. The electrical conductivity of the slurry, that we have developed some binders because we wanted to stay all aqueous based, so we've developed slurries that are, are water based. We use polyethylene glycol based polymers that are miscible with water. And we use small particles typically, and we use some conductive carbon additives also. So and after that, you do any thermal process to remove that polyethylene glycol or no? We do a vacuum heat treatment at about 80 degrees Celsius to dry it slowly. This picture I showed you at the end, there are some problems with it, which are some air bubbles here. We've since been able to eliminate that because of the heat, slow heat and heat that. Thank you very much, I <laughs> My guys can also <laughs> There, Gary, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, from the last one year, I've been reading papers where people have been using graphene. Yes. And then I told the key So according to you, how promising is that? I think that is very promising. I don't know how cheap it would be long term, but I know that there are people working on trying to figure out good ways to make graphene cheaply. Um, I think in terms of conductive additives for slurries, people have gotten a little bit farther so far with carbon nanotubes, as you saw from the previous lecture. Um, I don't know of any examples of industrial batteries that use any of that technology yet, but I don't, I don't think we would know that yet. But graphene certainly would be a very nice addition. Will it lead to a better performance? Yeah. Okay. yeah. But in this connection, it's not possible in graphene. The only useful useful part of the graphene is for electrical conductivity. Okay. That's all. Gary, did you have a question? Well, it could have been if I was missing. Where do you get the copper sponges from? We buy them from a company in the Netherlands and also a company in China. And the advantage of the company in China is that they can make it where they control the pore 
and you can tell them what pore sizes you want. That's important for this battery because we need to match the amount of cathode material to anode. Um, so right now we're just buying it. You can make it yourself, but we, we don't do that. How do they make it? They make it using um, a polymer that gets pressure extruded, and then they use electroless copper plating to coat that, and then they thermally burn off the polymer, and that's why you end up with the hollow foam. There are ways to make it where you electroplate while evolving hydrogen bubbles, and then you control the size of the bubbles, and that makes a bubble form. But, um, but we use the polymer based ones. Anything else? Finally, is it possible that we use ionic liquids, which is based on lithium? It is. Um, there are a couple of companies that are trying to do that, one here in Boulder actually, and one of my colleagues spent a long time trying to do that. The problem is ionic liquids are so hard to get clean, and typically the impurities always have smaller electrochemical windows than, than the ionic liquid itself. So you always get these parasitic losses to, to redox chemistry that has to do with whatever the impurities are. But in theory, it would be a great idea. I want to know, um, what's the stable, stable capacity of the CUSP with 3D structure? And uh, how about the, the second light? Is there any nice well, this was the first, this is the first one where we tried to see how long it would last with a 2C rate. Now, we know if we go faster, the capacity does drop, and the fastest we've gone is 15C. Um, what we figured out from that experiment was that our copper timonide was too thick, it was a couple of microns. Now we've gotten it down to less than a micron, and the capacity seems to be much better. Uh, but the other thing we figured out from this, as I mentioned, it was the liquid electrolyte, but more importantly, it was this LIPF6. So the commercial liquid electrolyte comes with a couple of parts per million water. So the LIPF6 decomposes to make HF, and that etches the aluminum contact. So if you, if you dry the electrolyte yourself, you can make this last a lot longer. Um, our solid state cells now we see about a 1% capacity drop after 100 cycles, and we stop there because we're limited by number of channels, but we, they, their, their capacity for so far, the capacity retention is very good. Okay, uh, reconvene here at 1.30 after lunch, correct? Okay.